Good morning, everyone. Uh, my wife and I are, <clears throat> are extremely excited to be here with you today, with Amy and Tyrone. Truly, God has uh, a sense of humor in the way he brings us together and builds relationships. And um, it's an interesting story I've told here before how we met. And we love this couple. They are truly a part of our family. I now have seven boys. My wife and I, we had six, but we have adopted Tyrone and Amy into our family. So it's always good to be here and to be at Rivers. We love Rivers Church. We love you folks. And we love what God is doing here and what God's doing through your pastor and his wife. Um, it's exciting to see the growth in their life and the journey they're on. And praise God for, for bringing them here and into our lives. We're so thankful for that. And um, we're excited because I finally got Tyrone uh, with me to go to somewhere. We tried to get to the Philippines, got shut down because of COVID. And uh, this year, uh, Tyrone's gonna join us in Kuwait. And our people in Kuwait are looking forward to having Tyrone come and to minister there and be a part of our family there. So. Tyrone, get ready, get your sleep, because they're going to keep you uh, very, very busy while you're there. That's for sure. Well, let's pray and let's jump into the Word, because I'm excited about our subject today. It's entitled, Making Multiplying Disciples, the Key to a Jesus Movement. I know you've been talking about a Jesus Movement uh, during this uh, month, I think, or the last couple months, Tyrone. Yep. And so when he asked me to do this, boy, I got excited about this. So <laughs> I'm glad to be here with this. Father, thank you for this time that we can come together. Thank you for your word. We pray your word will come, word will come alive and active in us today. Lord, that we'll be not just hearers of the word, but we will also become doers of the word. Lord, I pray for this church and each one that makes up this local body. I pray, Lord, that you will ignite a fire in their hearts, Lord, and that they will see the calling of God on their life to be fruitful multipliers, to be people that are touching their generation with the gospel of Jesus in a very powerful way. And Lord, we thank you for the impact that you're gonna have in our lives today and we're looking forward, Lord, to what you're gonna teach us. So teach us, Lord. Let me be your mouthpiece. All of you and none of me today, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. So if you have your Bibles, I'd like you to open them to that book of Acts, and I'll get there in a moment. I'm gonna quote some other scriptures in a little bit, but uh, you, I, I, I put some notes together. Uh, I don't know if you're like me, but I like to, when I leave, have something to hang on to. And when the pastor's speaking and I'm listening, sometimes it's hard to write down the notes. So I like to hand them out. Maybe you can uh, fill in a couple of blanks and then take them home and meditate on them later. I want to begin by asking you two questions. Number one, are you a disciple of Jesus Christ? Simple question. But are you a disciple of Jesus Christ? You may say, well, pastor, I think I am, but I thought that was those guys back there in the New Testament, but I'm not sure. Uh, okay, we'll get to that in a second. The second question I want to ask you is this. If you answered yes to the first one, then this one is not as easy. Because this question is this, it's a little more intimidating. Are you discipling others? The question is, are you a disciple? And the second question is, are you truly discipling others? Now to, to define my terms, let's start there because I don't want you to think, well, what does he mean by disciple? Let's clear that up. A disciple is a follower of Jesus Christ. That's the most simple definition that I could give you. A disciple is a follower of Jesus Christ. 
Now, no one follows Jesus perfectly, of course, but as a disciple, the direction and aim of your life is to be obedient to Jesus Christ and his teachings as revealed in the Word of God. Now, to disciple others is to help them follow Jesus. Now, that's as simple as I can get. If a disciple is a follower of Jesus Christ, then if you're discipling, what you're going to do is help others follow Jesus. A guy by the name of Mark Deaver defines it this way, and I like, this is quite an interesting little definition, but I like this. It's this. Discipling is deliberately doing spiritual good to someone so that he or she will be more like Christ. Isn't that a good definition? I like that. Doing something good to someone so that he or she will be more like Jesus. Now, in the Great Commission, Jesus commanded his followers this, Matthew 28, 18 to 20, that passage we, we love, as, especially as disciples, this passage starts out this way, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, all ethnic groups, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, the command to make disciples, and this is something that we all need to understand. The command to make disciples is not just a commandment for the pastors and the missionaries to follow. Come on, somebody. This is a command, the Great Commission, and by the way, it's not the Great Option, it's the Great Commission, and it's a commandment. This commandment is for all of us here today. Now, every Christian has received spiritual gifts, and I know your pastor teaches on this, and I know you believe that. Everyone in this room, every one of you, have received spiritual gifts. When you were born again, the Holy Spirit came into you and dwelt you. Now, when you're, as we walk in, that, in his presence in us, he flows out through us, and he's given us the ability to serve the Lord and his kingdom with these spiritual gifts. Now, part of the command for us to love one another involves helping others be what God wants them to be. That's discipleship. When I love someone, I'm going to do the best for them, right? Love does the best for the one loved. So when I love someone, then it's my goal in my life, in my ministry, to help them be more like Jesus. So if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, God wants you to use your spiritual gifts to help others become more like Christ. I don't care what your gift is. Encouragement, administration, I don't care. I don't care what your gift is. If you're the greatest miracle worker here, I want to tell you right now, whatever your gift is, ultimately you are to help others become more like Jesus. Now discipleship, let me warn you straight up. Discipleship should not be so much a program in the local church. Something that people sign up for. But rather, discipleship should be the culture of the church. It's where every member aims at helping others become more like Jesus. From the minute a person drives onto this parking lot until they leave this place, God's people need to move into action. As they walk through those doors, as they're sitting here, as they're involved in this worship service, as they leave this place, our goal 
And the culture of this place ought to be that we are ready to help those people become more like Jesus. Now, this begins in your home. By the way, let me say this. People say, well, I don't have any disciples. Are you married? Uh -huh. Do you have children? Uh -huh. You have disciples. It begins in your home. As parents, it is your first responsibility to evangelize and disciple your children. It is not the church's responsibility. Are you with me? The church ought to support you in what you're doing, not doing what you're not doing. That's the same way with school. If you're sending your kids to school to be educated, you've already started on the wrong spot. It's your job to educate your children and your school, wherever it is, ought to be aiding you in the process. Not them doing what you should be doing. It begins at home. Then it should ripple out through the entire church where all are helping one another grow in godliness. Not fighting, not upset, not gossiping. But throughout the entire body of Christ, we ought to be a people who are helping one another grow in godliness. Now, before we go any further, I want to clarify what discipleship is not. I told you what disciple is, discipleship is. Now, let me tell you what it's not, okay? Number one, discipleship is not, and I mentioned this, a program, please. I love discipleship material. You can find it in every Christian bookstore. You can get it online. Not many people go to bookstores anymore, but you can buy, you can pick it up. And Navigators, C Campus Crusade, there is more material than you could put in your house. You'd have to buy a new house. And I love good discipleship material, but I want to tell you, it's not about a program. It's not about just going through books and filling in blanks. Are you with me? Number two, it's not a class. Now, sometimes we, we have discipleship classes where we're training. Hey, look, in our network of churches, we've developed a very aggressive training program for our disciples and disciple makers. I'm not opposed to having some training in a class, but we don't call that discipleship. That's a class. That's a class. That's preparing you to disciple. Number three, it's not a special spiritual gift that some people have and some don't have. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. Your pastor has a gift of teacher and pastor. He's a very good communicator of the gospel. But look at folks. He doesn't have some special gift in discipleship that you don't have. It's not a gift. You can develop your abilities in discipling. Just as you can grow in your spiritual gifts, you can grow in this area of your life. And number four, and get this, because this is so true. It's not something some Christians do, the professional Christians. While others, the regular Christians like us here in the room, I, 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 maybe it's just me, but I, 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 I'm just regular. <laughs> While the regulars are exempt from this. Put simply, put it this way. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, your commander in chief has given you an order. Go make Disciples. Now you say, well, I'm not, I, I'm not called to be a missionary. Well, technically, okay, overseas maybe, but one sent missionary. You're, you're going to be sent. You're sent here. You're commissioned here to go forth and make disciples. But that's not 
to the missionary, to the pastor, to, it's to all of us. The go means while you're going, along the way, make disciples. It's not that I have to go to, to Kenya. It's not that I have to go to Kuwait. It's not that I have to go to the Philippines. I can do it right here. In fact, this is where I'm supposed to start. Right here. This means this then. First, a sincere believer can do it. You could do this. When Pastor Tyrone and Amy have been calling upon you saying, look, we're, God is leading us into deeper things and a deeper relationship and we want what God has for us. And in his word, he's called us to be disciples and we want to get to that. We want to be a church that is a disciple-making church. When they say that, it means this. A sincere believer can do it. And second, every sincere believer should do it, including you. So I want you to look at the chart that our brother's going to put up here on the screen in just a minute. If it's not already there, there it is. I want to show you just an example of what discipleship looks like. If you could chart it. It looks something like this. You see the first guy there? And he decided that he's gonna reach out to just three people, just three. Look, don't get caught up on the number of disciples. I started years ago in this discipling movement and there was a big push, 12. You gotta have 12, because there were 12 disciples. Actually, Jesus had more disciples, but there were 12 that he worked with in an intense way. But I want to tell most of you here today, you can't work with 12. Trust me. If you're really discipling 12 people, I take my hat off with it to you, or my toupee or whatever's up here. <laughs> Because discipleship involves relationship, the whole person in relationship. And I don't know about you, but you're busy people. And I get tired of Americans saying, this works overseas, but it doesn't work here. The reason it doesn't work here and it works overseas is because overseas we're working it. Here you're not. I'm sorry, it's true. It's not in a location that discipleship works. It's because People there have committed to doing it. You say, I don't have time. That's your problem. You have time for everything you want to do. You make time for what you want to do. And this is not something that we look at as something that is just wrecking our time. It's a joy when we really disciple people. But look at this guy disciples three. Those three disciple, just three. And I, I'm not saying this is a magic number. I'm just giving you an illustration. And those three groups all disciple three more. Look what happens. And then look at the exponential growth as that bigger group does the same thing. See, when I'm discipling someone, I ask them one thing. I'd love to disciple you, but I have one request. You do with others as I'm going to teach you to do. And if they don't want to do that, frankly, I have others that do want to do that. I don't get mean about it. I just say, look, maybe you're not ready, but when you are, let me know. You see, if you want to disciple someone, there should be some expectations involved in that. And we could talk about that another time. But it's the privilege that others are pouring into my life. And it's the joy of taking that and giving it to others. Now, if anyone knows discipleship, it's Jesus. Can I get an amen to that? Do you think he, do you think he knew about discipleship? His method of discipleship was real simple. Jesus drew 12 men to himself. He trained them and unleashed the movement of the gospel through them. In fact, you are in this place today because these men 
got serious about their calling. Jesus, get this, write it down, circle it. He had no plan B. Can I get an amen? The disciples were the plan. Now, now folks, he left, that, <laughs> he left the message in the hands of those disciples. And think about those guys. I love those guys. But they were as flawed as you are in so many areas of their life. But Jesus said, I'm going to trust you with the most important message the world has ever heard. Now, if, if you were me, and I think most people would probably have done it differently. Most people would have chosen another method to be sure that the people could hear of the sacrifice that Jesus made for them. Jesus had every resource available to him. After all, he was God, right? He's God, right? So he could have chosen to broadcast his death and resurrection to the entire world. You say, how could he have done that? They didn't have radios then, or TVs, or computers. You're right. He could have had a massive megaphone, and he could have preached it loudly from the heavens if he wanted to. He could have had angels disperse gospel tracts from the cosmos in every language of the world. He could have done that. Amen? Do you believe God could have done that? <laughs> Instead, Instead, get this, he simply poured himself into those 12 flawed men. <laughs> and you know what? All of them but one, and then he got Paul. And Paul did quite a bit, didn't he? But all of those guys did what God had called them to do. See, encountering Jesus with his disciples in the Gospels provides a snapshot of a simple discipleship process. You see, in the Gospel of Luke, and I'm going to be teaching on this a little bit in, in Kuwait when we go back again, but there's these distinct phrases that emerge in the Gospel of Luke. Calling, building, and sending. Those three phrases. These three phrases are sequential and are designed to move the disciple toward greater levels of commitment so that they can advance the gospel throughout the globe. This was God's method of establishing what we might call today the Jesus movement. Twelve guys and three simple phrases. He called them. He built them, and he sent them. He called them, he built them, and then he sent them. We look at somebody and we call them to stand up, be a disciple. We pour into them to be like Jesus. Not us, but Jesus. And then we say, now go on. Go do what you've just learned. But you may be asking today, why, pastor, why discipleship? Well, making disciples was one of Christ's main priorities in his earthly ministry, number one. That was his main priority. So if it was important to him, do you think it ought to be important to us? Jesus showed the importance of discipleship by making the training of the 12 disciples a priority during the three and a half years of his public ministry on earth. You see, he focused his time and attention on them. There were a lot of followers, a lot of people declared they were disciples, but those 12 he poured into the most. You can read that in Mark 3. He names who his disciples were, and I, I encourage you to read that. I'm not going to take the time right now. But he, he saw them, he saw the potential in them, he called them. Let me tell you, when you disciple someone, you see the potential in them. And you call them. Come on, let's go. Then Jesus commissioned all of his followers, number two, to train disciples because he intended fruit that would last, folks. 
not just counting professions of faith. So many churches today and so many organizations look to count the number of professions. Look, you can have a ton of professions today. How many are there tomorrow? Jesus wasn't counting professions of faith, but he asked for fruit that lasts. Amy read that to us earlier out of John 15. Abiding in him and, and we produce fruit that lasts. And in verse 8 it says, This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit. And when you bear much fruit, what does it say? You show yourself to be what? His disciple. You want to you you tell on yourself? You want others to know that you're his disciple? Let them see the fruit in your life. This was Jesus' method. This is what he did. When we started Life Connection Church in Kuwait, my wife and I, we started with a young couple and 10 guys and 12 girls that she had brought. We started meeting, just meeting, praying, and building this young couple who we expected them to do the same with those that they brought with them. Within 15 months, we had almost 2,000 people we were dealing with. It starts slow, but the multiplication begins to happen. Today, there are churches all over different countries of the globe because of the faithfulness of people. Just like that chart you saw, a few, did a few, did a few, are we discipling a few? During COVID, one of our people in Kuwait, they were locked in their houses. They had Zoom. They knew somebody in Canada. We're talking 9,000 miles away. They started discipling them in Canada and today, we have a Life Connection house church in Canada because of a couple who were not going to stand by and be just closed in their house. They decided we're gonna make our life count. So why discipleship? Well, first it was Jesus' priority. And second, multiplying disciples is how the first and second century church exploded in growth. We're talking about a Jesus movement, and I assume that most of you in this room saw the film. The story of Chuck Smith and Greg Laurie and all that took place in the early days, during the hippies. That, that was an example of somebody that poured into a few and a few and a few, and it, it's now exploded. The Calvary Chapel movement all over the United States and the globe, there's churches because Chuck Smith took a a risk on some unwanted people. You know what I found, folks? Look, God loves the spotted and the speckled. Hey, if you're looking for people just like you, how good you are, are, they're not my kind of folks. Look, there's always people that aren't your kind of folks, I guess. But I'll tell you, give me the spotted and the speckled then. Because when they get on fire, boy, do they get on fire. Discipleship is the best method, best method to reach our world for God. N- hands down. You can hold crusades all over the globe if you want to. But I'm telling you, the end result says, uh, look, we had, a deci- we had a, years ago, Billy Graham came to Seattle when I was pastoring in Seattle. Ninety some thousand people came. Thousands of professions of faith. And less than 1% of those people ended up in churches in the Seattle area. Now, I'm not against Billy Graham, so don't say Pastor Tim spoke against Billy Graham. I'm just telling you. If, and their goal in the, event, in the Billy Graham Association was churches to de- be discipling those who made decisions. It wasn't happening because the churches weren't discipling. The end result of discipleship is spiritually mature Christians. Folks, that's what we're headed for. That's what we want. We want to see you grow. We want to see others grow in their relationship with the Lord and in their walk with the Lord. 
So why discipleship? It's Jesus' priority, and it, has, it is how the early church exploded in growth. Now, discipleship is all about fruitfulness and multiplication. That's why you wonder, why did Amy read that verse in Genesis and then over in John? Because right from the beginning, God created man to be fruitful and multiply. You say, well, that was to have babies. Okay, have babies physically, multiply. But it was more than that. It was multiply and subdue the earth. And then man sinned. And then God redeemed. And in the redemption story, your identity and your purpose was restored. And he's called you today to be a fruitful multiplier. To be a spiritual, fruitful multiplier. And that's what John is all about. John 15. Fruitfulness and multiplication are tightly connected. When you're fruitful, there will be multiplication. And fruitful people are multipliers. Fruit, more fruit, what? Much fruit. Fruit, more fruit, much fruit. That's how it works. You start with fruit. Then you have more fruit. Then you have what? Much fruit. Now I want you to notice how you can be a fruitful multiplier. I think I wrote those in your notes, but it's this. First, be connected to the vine in John 15. Be connected to the vine. He abides in you, folks. Through salvation, the Holy Spirit lives in us and brings the life of Christ to us. Amen? Amen? So be connected. Number two, feed from the vine. Feed. Amy talked about that when she t- said about abiding. Look, when we abide in Him through the Word, through prayer, through meditation, we will experience the fruit of His work in our lives and those that we're working with. When we're abiding, and look, get this clear. When I talk about discipleship, your discipleship needs to flow out of an abiding relationship with Him. Otherwise, you're trying to disciple people to yourself. I saw that happening throughout the globe and places I have been, let me tell you, and it makes me sick. It's all control. It's about control, not pointing people to Jesus, pointing them to me, and I'll tell you how to live. That's not the way it works. Wow, preach it. And number three, not only do we feed from the vine, you're connected to the vine, but we need to be pruned by the vine dresser. Let him continue to prune you. Don't fight the pruning work of the Holy Spirit. Don't fight that. It, it can be painful. Yeah. But the, the reason you prune is why? So you get more fruit. Amen? And that's our goal. Now, I want you to look. I wrote down some things here because as I've been thinking about this, the book of Acts is a great place. And I wish I had a bunch of time to do this in another session. Because you just start going from Acts 2, if you want to, you can start in 1, but basically you could start at 2 and just start reading through the book of Acts. And you will see how multiplication occurs. By the way, multiplication is a marked increase in the number, amount, or amount of something. It's a marked increase in the number or an amount of something. So you're seeing growth. In fact, I found it rather interesting. When you start in Acts 2, they got filled with the Holy Spirit. That's where she read Acts 2, 2 and 4, 2 through 4, is talking about the Holy Spirit filling them. And then, and the gifts coming upon them and all that, all the wonderful things that took place at Pentecost. By the way, that's coming up here right away. Pentecost Sunday. We celebrate this event. But Holy Spirit comes, and then you notice at the last verse of Acts 2, look at that last verse. It says this, So those who received his word were baptized and were added that day about 3,000 souls. Now, dude, if 3,000 is addition, what is multiplication? Think about this a minute. So the first day was only adding 3,000 
That's crazy, man. You, no wonder the early church had problems dealing with the believers, the new believers, because all of a sudden, you go to 3,000 new people in one day? Is that crazy? Well, it didn't stop there, though. Because as you go back and you start reading through, you start seeing Acts chapter 4, Acts chapter 5, Acts chapter 6, Acts chapter 9. Go back there, verse 31, real quick. Because in 9 and verse 31, we finally see Paul on the scene. And it says in verse 31 of 9, So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. It what? Multiplied. It was no longer just addition. Multiplication is taking place. And that's what God's plan is for us and for our church. Multiplication. But before we can multiply, we got to get ready. We got to be ready. I want you to notice the keys to multiplication. I'm not going to be able to develop it. I just want you to look. And it's right out of Acts 2. First was biblical repentance. Do I need to say much about that? Look, you'll never multiply something that you're not. If you're not born again, except in Jesus Christ, then, then you're, not going to be repro- you're not going to be reproducing others like that. So first thing, you need to be born again. Biblical repentance. Acts 2.38. Number two, the baptism or the filling or the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Look, forget discipleship without Holy Spirit because all it is is a flesh thing. You might as well join Amway. Sorry, sorry. I mean, if you want multi-level marketing, go there. This is not my, we're talking about if you want the Holy Spirit's work in your life, he better be there. This is beyond the indwelling work of the Holy Spirit. This is the total control and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. When we get to chapter 9, verse 31, boy, look at Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit. It is his life in me, through me, no longer I, but Christ. And this is what happens when all of a sudden signs and wonders start being released in our lives as we pray for people. Number three, the supernatural work of God working through us confirming the message of Christ. In other words, proof of the deity. That we see in the, in the, in the book of Acts. Look at these people were out reaching out with the gospel and they were praying for people and things were happening. And what happened? Disciples were multiplying. Number four, intimate communication in prayer. Tyrone, I'm so excited you started a prayer time at nine o'clock. That's awesome. Because multiplication must come through a dynamic prayer life. We must recognize our complete dependency on him and his provisions, guidance, power for our life. We must thirst for him, long for him, and spend time with him, intimacy with him. It must be there. Number five, a life saturated with the word and our ministry to others centered in the word. This will require consistency on our part in the Word of God. Look, are you in the Word? Look, if you want to grow, first you got to start there. You got to be in the Word of God. Your pastor talks about it. You got to be in the Word. And it's not just Sunday morning. Also, the application of the Word of God. Are you a doer of the Word, not just a listener? An impartation of the word to others. That's what you're doing. And number six, a commitment to building deep and meaningful relationships. You you will never disciple and you will never see multiplication if you are not committed to building deep and 
meaningful relationships because true discipleship takes place on three levels. A spiritual father, a spiritual brother, and a spiritual son. Paul, Barnabas, and Timothy. Relationships that are real and open. Relationships that address the needs of those we serve. Look, if you, if you haven't been in a go group yet, maybe you better try that. You better start there. We call that like kindergarten discipleship. Just start with go group. Start there, man. Start there. Be accountable with each other. Challenge each other. Read the word together. And commit to a relationship with people. And number seven, a determination to walk in unity. See that one accord? They had all things in common. They were in one accord. Acts 2.44, 46, 4.32, 5.12. Look, personal sacrifice, personal resolve that nothing will be allowed to destroy it, and personal involvement. When we got involved in discipleship, let me tell you, we learned a lot. My wife one time came to me and said, they're in my kitchen. I said, who's in the kitchen? All your disciples are in my kitchen. They're eating everything out of the refrigerator. I said, hallelujah. <laughs> we had to get it all. I told my guys, I said, look, my refrigerator is your refrigerator. I didn't know what that would mean. I forgot to tell my wife the same thing. <laughs> we loved it. It was about life on life. My little Filipino guy that I worked with so long, still do, he's my eighth son, I guess. But Pastor Allen, I taught him how to eat peanut butter and apples. He'd never heard of that. He thought that was the sickest thing in the world. And now he loves peanut butter and apple. I'm a real disciple maker, see? So let me close with this, and the rest you'll have to figure out on your own, because I'm running out of time. How multiplication is birthed through us. Now, you're going to get a little education class here. So all the little kids can plug their ears if they can't handle this. Here you go. This is how you birth, all right? Our repentance is the womb for multiplication. We have to be saved first. And we have a womb that where the Holy Spirit dwells. Second, intimate communication is the egg for multiplication. You gotta, you gotta have the stuff there. The Holy Spirit, number three, is the fertilizer that makes multiplication possible. It takes the Holy Spirit put into that egg. The Word of God is what allows the gestation of the multiplication process to occur. So it's the Word of God that you're mulling on the Word of God together. You're growing together. And you're, 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 you're just spending time abiding with Him and in His Word. And this is growing. It's all growing in you. It's growing in them. The next relationships are where multiplication is ultimately birthed out of. It is experienced and seen through our relationships. And lastly, and this is important, unity keeps the multiplication process going. Unity keeps it going. This kind of life will mean this, and get it down quick. Extreme commitment, extreme results, Extreme sacrifice and extreme multiplication. Extreme commitment, verse 42. Extreme results, verse 43. Extreme sacrifice, verse 45. And extreme multiplication, verse 47. I'll leave this last part for Tyrone, Pastor. You can work on this one. But the environment of small groups and one-to-one -one is the best environment to make disciples. Look, Pastor Tyrone has a heart to build micro-churches. 
small church, house churches. We have almost a hundred of them just in Kuwait. Small country. That is a hotbed for growth to take place in the lives of people and in the lives of the community. Jesus chose 12 and even the 12, he worked with a smaller group of three. So small group and one to one is where discipleship happens. And disciples are made through relationships, not programs, folks. And to do that, there's got to be trust. You have to trust each other. You have to trust your leadership. You've got to believe in each other, believe the best in each other. That's hard sometimes when you've been abused and hurt. But I want to tell you right now, God wants you to move into this. Because it's the safest place for you not to get abused when you really develop healthy relationships. There must be accountability. Stay connected to the body. So what's your part in the discipleship process? Put yourself in a place to be discipled. Say, Pastor, or don't even bother him. If you see somebody in this church that you would love to pour into your life, why don't you go up to them and say, hey, could you take some time to pour into me a little bit? I see in you what I want in me. So the first thing you gotta do is make yourself available. And then we must willingly submit to the process. You gotta get in the process. If you're bucking the process, you're never gonna grow in this. And then you've got to be committed to the process. Get committed. Folks, why I love you, I'm excited to see what God's doing here and in you and through you and will do. But you've got to take the first step. It's not Pastor Tyrone who can take your step. You've got to take a step. If you want to go to Pastor Tyrone and Amy, go up and say, I'm ready. I am ready to do this. You know why? One of the reasons I wanted Pastor Tyrone to go with me? Because I want him to see it in action in other places. And see that it's, it's possible. He believes it's possible. That's why he's do, seeking to bring all of you into this relationship. But I also want him to see it in action. And I want him to see it in action through your lives. Father, we want to thank you today for loving us enough to commit to us your word and to call us to share this message with others. Lord, thank you for believing in us even in times when we don't believe in ourselves. And I pray, Lord, that we will be a people that convicted today by your spirit, challenged, encouraged. And Lord, we'll be willing to stand before you today and say, Lord, I'm in, Lord. I'm in. I don't know what all it's going to do. I'm just ready to learn. I'm just ready to grow. I'm just ready to help others become more like you. Thank you, Lord. If you can use me, you can use any of these people, Lord. And I pray that you'll do that today. Move in their hearts and their lives. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Let us be doers of your word. God's people said, amen.